Okay, that's our backup. Right, um, I'm seeing now that we're going to get a feed on Facebook, so looks like we're live. Okay, I'm just checking it on here. Oops. Yeah, yep, you're coming in now. So we're just going to see what happens because this is the first time that I've actually streamed it to a page rather than my profile. Um, okay. but, but I can see already that uh, we're already going to have technical problems because as long as you can hear me, I, I you could, because we do, you, I'm probably frozen at your side, right? Uh, I've got no picture of you at all. I've just got kind of your background. You've got the background at least, okay. But the camera's working and everything's working. So I'm not sure why the, these little blips are happening now. So let me just, oh, yeah. I'm just trying to see what's- Yeah, now you've come back. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's some sort of glitch, which I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, but let's go for what we've got because I'll, we'll have the recording anyway and we can always stick it out again. But um, I'm just trying to see if I can find a place where it's actually streaming to so that um, I can see if there's any comments. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time either. So let me just see. Yeah. From what I see that we are, we are streaming. So let's okay. go with what we've got. All right. Yes. So um, good evening and welcome to the virtual conference live talks with myself, Dov Ben Yakov Kurtzman. And once again, we have a star guest for us uh, tonight, Mark Webster. Now, Mark Webster, I could go on and on and on because I met Mark Webster three years ago at what I call the Manchester Massacre, um, in which 22 young people lost their lives at the Manchester Arena suicide bombing. At that time, I put out a call for help um, to see who could come and help me um, set up a, um, a support center in the middle of Manchester. And one of the first people to contact me was Mark Webster through a mutual friend. And uh, basically, you, Mark, were the one that put out the word on your network and got me the over 70 volunteers. I would say the most of them came from your network um, to be trained in special protocols that we trained up. And of course, the rest is history from there. Um, I'm not going to introduce you myself apart from that, Mark, apart from the fact that I'm extremely grateful to you then and once again, extremely grateful for you coming in um, and talking to me tonight. But I'm going to let you actually introduce yourself um, and give us an update on what you're up to just now, what you're doing. What I will say, though, is that Mark Webster is one of the original authors of uh, the Matrix, um, Act Matrix uh, uh, workbook. And uh, I use the matrix almost every day in my uh, clinic and any work groups that I do. So um, please mention that as well. Of course, I'm sure you will. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Mark. Thanks, Doug. Um, hmm. I don't want to take up too much of people's time with the history, but... And I guess it started with getting into behavioral stuff with DBT in the mid 90s in the UK. That was my first encounter really with um, behavioral science. And I didn't, can't say that I loved it from the off. You know, I was a little bit off put by, by the behavioral stuff to start with, but it grew on me. And it was really with ACT that, that um, I, I really felt behavioral science was a route that I wanted to go down and I, I picked it up very early on in 1999. There weren't, there weren't really any people in the UK doing it so I set up some trainings. Steve Hayes came over, Kelly Wilson came over, um, Robin Walser came over and yeah. Sonia Batten came over for which I'm extremely grateful and did some trainings here in the early part of the 2000s, first decade of the 2000s. 
That's um, wonderful. Where, where what about, was that? Was that in Manchester or London? That was with the BABCP, which is the lead body for CBT in the UK. So they came over to the conferences. I think Steve came over twice. And we did, I remember doing a, some kind of keynote address kind of thing in a large lecture theatre with Steve and four or five hundred people. Um, and, and that whole kind of wave of interest in ACT in the UK now, came, here's a came off the back of that. And then uh, by what route, I'm not quite sure. I ended up with Kevin working out the Matrix in about 2007-8. Right. And that was a real shift because I was a was kind of pretty orthodox therapist at that time, seeing patients one-to-one, -one, working in the NHS. And I veered very much off into addiction, which is where a lot of the work I'm doing now. Um, and with the matrix, more and more working in the sort of tradition of the of the 12 steps of the fellowships, as they call it, mutual aid. Yeah. We've set up a new, so since 2014, we've set up a, an organization which is now called Pause Recover, uh, which basically has taken the matrix on to the next level doing much more structured interventions using people in recovery themselves so i've kind of veered away from being a therapist i'm actually retired um, i've been retired for a couple of years and right. we do this peer-based mutual aid whatever you want to call it version um of and that's a science. national that's a national organization is it it is yeah we we've got the uh, approval of Public Health England. So we're sort of recognised in national policy in the UK too. Sounds wonderful. And um, so people watching this are watching this because we're living in very unusual and strange times, as you know. Mm. And uh, as time goes on, especially in the UK, we're going now into the third week of our lockdown and there are countries people from countries watching this that have been even longer in uh, lockdown um, and so things are beginning to get a little bit distressful for some anyway um, so especially those I would say that are in recovery even this might be um, uh, extremely difficult time for them uh, in addition to, to everything else that's going on I would like to ask you with your vast experience and wisdom and, and knowledge, what is it that you can put over for us tonight that will, will help all of us, including myself, um, get through this surreal time? It is, isn't it? It's, it's very surreal um, and very challenging, I think. When I think, yeah, I'm in a pretty fortunate position but I think many, many people being locked down in the UK, must, it must be incredibly restrictive, especially if you're in a, in a city or a highly populated area. Um, so what we've been doing with, uh, so we've been doing online work on Zoom, funnily enough, with our peers, as we call them. And one of the things is this concept of a direction. So within ACT, it, it was called values. And if you look carefully in the literature, it kind of says values comes first. It, it, it's the sort of main component of the six components. And it's one of the things that what I and we talk about incessantly is the idea of getting a clear sense of direction. So we use the word direction instead of value. And what we're encouraging people to do is to sit down at the beginning of every day and, and if possible, post this on a WhatsApp group and focus on what's your main direction for the day, to have a kind of clear sense of something that's going to be really important on the day and to set that up right at the beginning of the day so that it gives some structure because I, I think certainly that's one of the problems. If you have your normal structure taken away, what are you going to replace it with? So that, that's, that would be my first piece of advice if I was to give a piece of advice. So is that a sort of a goal orient, orientation of what I'm going to accomplish for the day or is it something 
something else yeah i mean it's it's in that direction <laughs> in that direction so so like for me i mean if we think of i talk about learning by example so it's easier to give examples so for me what's been important over the weekend was to get outdoors and to be active so that was the direction and so what i did over the weekend was i the things i did was i mended my bicycle it had a flat tire and then i took my bicycle out and i went down to a place where i can go for a swim and i went for a swim in a very cold um river but that that was kind of my direction over the weekend and so it kind of gave me some structure and i probably wouldn't have fixed that tire otherwise because it's been sitting there for a few months um, being unattended. So um, it's the first time that I've heard of um, values kind of being used in that way. I've heard it being a direction, a compass and so on, but yeah. using it in a practical way as in what's your direction of the day. It's the first time I've, um, I've come across that. And Ad, I, I see Adam Layton is writing in the comments on one of our uh, viewers on Facebook Live saying, I like the use of the term direction. It makes it a much more kind of, I don't know, a much gentler way of understanding because sometimes values can be a little bit um, confusing exactly what they are, need more explanation where direction seems to be very clear. Exactly. I mean, I think, I mean, I've been doing, well, I've been involved with that for over, well, nearly 20 years now. And one of the things that showed, that showed up a lot, and it showed up for me too, was, oh, uh, I've got three different values. Which one do I choose? Uh, and it's something that I, think I hear, have heard quite a lot. Um, because I think that values can be, become quite sort of mental or, or you know, thought-based. Yeah. In their kind of conceptualization. And the idea of a direction is it's something much more behavioral and and something that's important to you is important to you right now. So it's a kind of here and now concept. Um, and you can ask yourself this question when you're doing something like doing this, uh, whatever this is called, podcast. I can ask myself, hmm, is this something that feels right for me? In the here and now, and I could go, yeah, you know, that kind of does. And you could ask yourself that question, and and the audience could ask themselves, is listening to us talking, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the right <laughs> direction for them. So it's a here and now question, uh, which allows you to orientate yourself over the longer term. Wow! And so you say, um, do this on a kind of daily basis. At the, I'm, I'm talking about going through this period that we're going through now. So basically have this kind of question in the morning of, um, you know, what's my direction of the day? That's, that's the kind of a starter. Yeah, but, but also if you meet up with someone, you know, it, it's kind of like, you know, what, what's, our, what's our direction? It doesn't have to be a kind of single person concept. It can be a concept for a group. So if you move into the, Ostrom stuff and, and what David Stone Wilson talks about, this idea of group purpose is kind of like collective direction. So it becomes an organizing principle for behavior, uh, either individually or collectively. So the family could say, well, what's important to us as a family today? Wonderful. And parents with children could, could have that kind of concept as well. What's going to be important for us today? What, what is our direction of the day? talking to to children absolutely and it's it's a kind of collaborative uh endeavor isn't it to, to work that out if you're doing it in a family so that's your first um opener what where would we take it from then <laughs> i thought i'd done pretty well <laughs> <laughs> i'm taking full advantage of you i don't get this wonderful uh quality time with mark webster and just to let it go on that uh, yeah, I feel like I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> it, was a, um, it was a great starter. Well, I, I guess, you know, the next thing you, you could do, once you know what your direction is, then you can ask yourself, is what I'm doing now towards or away 
from my direction. So you can start noticing during the day where your kind of behavior is drifting, if you like, um, yeah. with regards to your direction. So there's this idea of a baseline. So the, the whole idea of this goes back to functional contextualism, uh, which Steve Hayes kind of wrote about in 1993, that, that your direction is a baseline. Uh, it's a baseline that then allows you to decide or choose or evaluate or monitor whether your behavior is congruent or taking you in the direction that you said at least that you wanted to go in. So that brings you back to the kind of like the compass metaphor where you have something to to measure up to whether whether you're on so you're not getting sort of vertigo you know you don't know if you're you think you're going the right path and you're not really um so it kind of gives you that baseline as you called it so you can measure yourself whether you're going in the right direction or not because i suppose some people think that they're going in the right direction and actually they're not i think that's the problem isn't it is that often going in the wrong direction feels like the right thing to do because it's yeah. perhaps more comfortable sometimes to drift away from your direction because it's away from what's uncomfortable and often doing what, what's towards your direction is more uncomfortable. This is the driving the bus metaphor from ACT. Yes. So, so that often to move towards something that's important, there'll be an element of pain and discomfort that, that we need to take on board the bus. So, so, so taking that as a lead in while we're living the way we're living just now, and I would imagine it's got a lot more pain and discomfort than, than we normally have, or at least we might be noticing it more than we normally have because we have possibly less distraction. Exactly. So uh, We're going to feel that more. Exactly. So suddenly we have a whole lot more time and, and a whole lot less opportunity. So, so the kind of context is changed massively and I think you know what ACT is about in its best form and certainly what we talk about is adapting uh, and that's I think you know we're kind of like two weeks in and we to the lockdown now in the UK yeah um, and and there's a lot of adapting to do uh, in a very uncertain world because we don't know how long the lockdown is going to last it, it's a very difficult time so I understand that you are in Germany at the moment. I am. And are you in lockdown there too? How is it? What's happening there? Well, I mean, I, I chose, or we chose to come back to Germany because we live in the Black Forest. And so I'm in a farmhouse up a valley um, where the kind of idea of lockdown doesn't really apply terribly. Um, but yeah, Germany has very strict controls. Um, borders are locked down um, yeah it, it's 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 the same and i think the social distancing is the thing i notice the most and uh, i get really quite angry when i see people not observing social distancing so that's something that i've noticed as well and and to a point where at one certain points it quite disturbs me mm. how aggressive and <laughs> almost violent people can get towards those who are not keeping the rules, if you like. Um, I can understand that they might not be, you know, they're going against society norms at this time um, and that that generates extra distress. But what bothers me is the amount of anger, the amount of um, aggression that could lead I think to something even more than that it could lead to physical aggression. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure quite I've experienced it quite as extensively as that, but I, I suppose I think about if I feel when I see someone coming down the path towards me and I stand to one side and they don't stand to the other side and I get angry, it's actually fear. Yeah. It, it's sort of fear and I think disrespect as well. It, it's a sort of a sense of being, um, yeah, sense of just being disrespected. So 
how do you and your family get through these days from, you know, what, what do you use as um, coping mechanisms or any other kind of skills in order to get through this unknown ending period? We don't have an end at the moment in sight of this. So how do you actually cope with this yourself personally? Yeah, I, mean, I, I feel a bit guilty in the sense of, so while I'm in Germany, I, I usually work from home. This is my office. Uh, and actually, in some ways, the lockdown means I have less work than normal. Um, and I can concentrate more on the things I want to concentrate on and have a little bit more time for myself. So I'm, it, it's really not been a question of coping at all for me. It, it, it's been a question of um, almost having a break which sounds terrible uh, and then I feel very, I feel gutted when I look at the death figures in particular and um, think about some of the restrictions that other people are having to deal with and, and that's I think what's surreal because in some ways where I am right now it's fine and yet obviously I know that for lots of people, particularly probably those in the cities, that, that it's a very, very different experience. Yeah, it sounds like a beautiful location that you're in, and I suppose that is the confusing part, isn't it? Because the world is in turmoil, and yet you can look out and see such natural beauty. And I suppose there's also, if we can say there is some positive sides to what's going on, and from what I understand, the planet is being cleaned, you know, from pollution. You know, it's not the way that we'd want it to be done, but the, nevertheless, I think we should also notice that these things are going on. Um, and it's holding, I think, these two yeah. um, sides of the things. There's the, the break time, the beauty, the spending more time with family and, and, and children and and so on, but that then there's the on the other side the fear, what economical price we're paying, what health price we're paying, what life price we're paying, and it's kind of being able to hold both of them at the same time, which we're not necessarily used to doing on a daily basis. No, I agree with you. I think that that's how I feel that there's a sort of disparity between my own existence here which is very it's kind of privileged under these circumstances um, and what's going on um, for people which clearly is you know is, is very desperate especially people who are losing their loved ones and I, you know, I, i'm not sure how how they're managing to kind of do funerals and things like that it, it's sort of, it's very, it just seems very surreal, you know, like there's, there's a sort of two extremes. Absolutely extremes. What would be your, you know, what would you say to those who are, you know, since it's your um, specialist, specialization at the moment anyway, which is about people in recovery, and how would you, how would you, um, you know, get them to approach what we're going through because it might be specifically difficult for these people because they're also isolated now. They might even be finding themselves on their own or they might be, you know, in their families but finding this extra pressure and extra distress driving them and their urges towards um, using substances or alcohol or whatever it is that they've been trying to get over with um you know how can you give some guidance to these people i don't think i can to be honest i just can't i can't kind of imagine it it's really kind of hard to imagine what it's like say if you're normally used to going out and getting alcohol and drinking alcohol and suddenly your movements are restricted or if you have an under, you know, like if you have an underlying health condition, I, I kind of, I honestly can't put myself in that position. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be very difficult. 
And your peer-to-peer organisation, how are they adapting to this then? Yeah, we switched online. So um, we're using Zoom as much as possible, WhatsApp groups, um, and, and kind of the web in general. So um, we, I kind of, in the areas where we run meetings, which is particularly in the northwest of England, we, what we, I've put up a couple of um, web forms so that you can contact us direct through the Facebook pages. So we have a Facebook page, Paul's Recover, uh, Langstrom Walk, and Paul's Recover Fleetwood, Paul's Recover Manchester, etc. And on the page, there's a, there's a button which allows you to kind of have direct access and, and speak to one of the peers um, via a contact form on the web. So, so we're kind of initiating more of a kind of direct access uh, type of approach. So if somebody was struggling and they wanted some peer-to-peer support, yeah. um, you know, how, how they could just refer themselves to you or your organization or to one of your um, contacts? Yeah, I mean, that, obviously the idea of, in its best form of mutual aid is that it's completely open access. And, and so we're trying to use the Facebook pages for open access. So if you take, um, so Langstrom Morgan, where we're doing a lot of the, the testing at the moment, on the page, if you go on the Facebook page, pause cover Langstrom Morgan, there's a button underneath the main picture, which says learn more. And then if you push the button, it takes you through to a web form, which allows you to contact uh, pause recover in that area. And we have a three hour response time uh, so in other words, in working hours. So if, if you fill the form in at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day, then some will get back to you by three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and we're looking to roll that out um, in the Northwest. And we're talking to our partners about the possibility of kind of extending this as a facility during a crisis to a, to a wider re- range of people than we normally would do. So that's pretty quick response, I would think. Um, could you spell out that address for us, please? And then I'll also put it in the comments after so, this. But so it's, you can Facebook, spell it out. it's a Facebook page. So it's Pause Recover, one word, P A U S E R E C O V E R. And if they, they tend to be local, but at the moment we're using Lancaster and Morecambe as our kind of development page. So pause, recover, Langstrom, Morecambe. There's a button underneath the main picture which says learn more, takes you through to a web form where you just basically give us your contact details, say how you want to be contacted. Someone will get back to you within three hours and then obviously ask you what it is that you want help with. And from your experience from your organisation during those, these days, um, do you find that the peers are um specifically finding these times are more distressing than than usual what kind of feedback are you getting back from them regarding their recovery yeah no, no I, I think some of the problems and this is a historical problem in um in recovery i mean first of all we could go into we could talk about the dynamics of recovery for quite a long time but if you look at people who come through into the services generally they have quite low engagement with IT. So the the very first piece of work we often do is just learning how to use either WhatsApp or Zoom or something like that. Um, that, That's kind of part of the problem uh, in, in the sort of traditional group of people who end up in the services. And do they find any concern with, um, you know, using these uh, platforms and confidentiality, um, you know, feeling that, that, that they're exposed more than usual? We, we, have quite a, we, we have quite a careful kind of, I don't like to use the word induction, but I can't think of a better word. 
um, based around our guidelines. So everything within Pause Recover is based around or operates within a set of guidelines. And so, for instance, on the WhatsApp group, we don't let people straight into the WhatsApp groups until they demonstrate that they understand what we mean by confidentiality, which means if somebody posts a picture, you're not allowed to share it, and you, you would agree to that before we, we start the WhatsApp uh, group permissions. So it's kind of moderated, and the idea of quality is a very important idea within Pause Recover, that we, that, that we make it a safe place for people. Sounds, it sounds like it's a great alternative to the traditional peer-to-peer uh, -peer groups that are out there. It's very small <laughs> at the moment. Is it? Right. Yeah. Okay, so um, everyone has to start in a small place and, and yeah. move up from there. Um, so uh, I don't want to take much of your time. I know you're a busy person, and I really appreciate um, you coming in tonight. We've had um, a good response, people, uh, people uh, streaming in. If there's any questions, I'll uh, just give them a few minutes. If we've got Denise Journal joined, we've got um, Jane Silver joined, we've got Adam Layton joined, we've got a few others there. If there's anyone's got any particular questions uh, for Mark, now is the time. Um, Mark, any uh, apart from the fact that uh, your organization is working in the Northwest, you're living in Germany just now, um, is your uh, is your plans to come back to the UK once all this kind of crisis is over or is Germany your home now? Well, I know I can, what's happening is that, is that Pause Recover is kind of taking off and reaching, it's becoming bigger. So in fact, I was in the process of relocating to Lancaster in February and March when the coronavirus hit. Right. Um, but <laughs> because I haven't got a home there, <laughs> I basically hightailed it back to Germany, where where also I think for self isolating it's it's a good place to self isolate. Okay, wonderful. So, Mark, um, we shouldn't leave it so long before we meet up uh, again. I uh, again I appreciate what you've done for me in the past. And I appreciate you joining me uh, today. And uh, I wish you uh, stay healthy and uh, have great success in your uh, Pause Recover group. And um, if there's anything I can do for you anytime, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Webster, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Dove. And uh, I hope you find a a nice succession of interesting guests to uh, keep us busy during these difficult times. Thank you once again. Take Good day. Care. Bye now.